Hi, good evening, and welcome to AI Talks Live, a production of the global AI community. Um, I am very excited to be welcoming Jamie Dixon here with us tonight. So welcome, Jamie. Hello. Jamie has been writing code for as long as he can remember and has been getting paid to do it since 1995. He was using C Sharp and JavaScript almost exclusively until discovering F Sharp and more recently Python. Uh, Jamie is a Microsoft MVP in developer technologies and is currently based in Denver. So uh, welcome, Jamie. We're excited to, to hear you speaking about Azure and AI services today and how we can use Lewis to extract meaning from the content obtained. Sounds good. Thank you, Alicia, for the introduction. And I have to apologize. This is my first time using um, StreamYard. I can't see uh, people and raising their hands. So if you want to unmute yourself to ask me questions at any point in the presentation, I think we're a small enough group. I'll uh, take frequent pauses, and um, you can ask me anything you'd like, and I'll do my best to answer them. Also, there'll be time at the end for follow-up questions. Cool. Yes, please, please feel free to, to ask questions. And uh, Jamie, I can go ahead and keep an eye on the comment window, and um, I can go ahead and call out questions to you as they come along. OK. And I'm going to share screen number one. And uh, how does that look? Let me have five that. She got five that. Is that pretty good? Yeah, looking good. Okay. Um, so, uh, as mentioned, I am in Denver, and I just moved here about uh, six to eight weeks ago. And uh, so I, I did. I picked a an alpine theme for this. Uh, you know, there's no analogy of summiting heights for natural uh, language processing. But my current gig right now uh, is working with a large company that had a very interesting problem. And uh, because of the cloud, because of Lewis, and uh, because of F Sharp, uh, we solved this problem really well. And um, so I wanted to take you through it as sort of a success story to show you some of the pieces we used and highlight some of the places where, wow, this stuff is really a game changer. And then we'll do a deeper dive into the AI pieces of it, which I know uh, folks on the on the on the video cast would be interested in. So that's the plan tonight. Sounds exciting. Thank you. Uh, so I am Jamie Dixon, and it is the fourth of June, and uh, this is how we're going to go forward with Azure Functions, Cognitive Services, and Lewis, and uh, how you can win. So this big company has an in-house legal department. This legal department is trying to get ahead of any lawsuit that might hit the company. So, um, just a quick question, Jamie. Sure, sure. Um, are you, would you be able to share your presentation screen? I think right now we have the. Uh, I think we have the pres presenter screen. Is well, that's there... <laughs> here. You know what? I'm messing with something smarter than me with dual screens. Let me try it like this. You ready? Shift F5 that, and then. That's still the problem? Uh, yes, I think you can go to uh, display settings, switch. Uh, screen. Hold on. I'm really sorry, everyone. No worries. I, I like the trees and the snow. <laughs> no, I just, you know, and if you can see my screen over here on the right, you can see that, um, yeah, that's some Rocky Mountain love here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to share it like this. I'm going to minimize like that. And then I'm going to hit F5. How does that look? I hope better. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Perfect. So, love it. Thank you. And thank you for that, um, that save. So yeah, so this legal department in a big company um, is trying to get ahead of any potential lawsuit that might hit them. And one way they do it is to do a market scan of their competitors and see what has hit them and try to get ahead of any situations that potentially, potentially might hit them, the, the current company uh, in the future. And they have news aggregation sites. Um, however, those news aggregation sites are not particularly um, robust enough for them. So they literally have an intern 
and a couple junior lawyers when they have the opportunity to manually go through the internet with a certain set of URLs and they need they launch in searches and then they get results and then they sort of read those things manually and then they put it into some kind of spreadsheet to sort of say, well, these ones might be a problem in the future. As you can imagine, it's labor intensive. It was um, because they could only do it occasionally. There was obviously some quality issues. Uh, and, and the interesting thing to me was that when they were reading these um, websites and these uh, actions, they would sometimes misread them. And so they wanted a systematic way of uh, reading all these things and um, a way of distilling this down into only finding the, the really important ones. And Typically, when I work on a project, I define the project as either a, a revenue generation, a cost savings, or a cost avoidance. And if I can't put that project in any one of those three buckets, I typically don't want to work on that project. Um, so this was a cost avoidance scenario. And um, what they're really trying to do is avoid to get in, into any lawsuit, obviously, ahead of time, because lawsuits at this level can be uh, millions of dollars. Any questions about the project? All right then, so what, what are we delivering? What are we trying to, to automate? So we have a series of websites, like that one on the top, which is the United States uh, Attorney's website. There's some keywords up there. So in that case, on the screenshot, <coughs> excuse me, you see it says pharmacy. And you can type in any text you want and you get some results. We then have to go into individual ones of those links, um, pull that text out, see if it applied or not, and then put that into this running spreadsheet that gets run every night. And you can see the spreadsheet, it might be a little bit too small to read, but the columns going across are pretty much what you'd expect. You have a, a GUID or a GUID, depending on what part of the world you're in, um, as the document ID and then what kind of information. So we're mapping the regulator, the states that is happening, when it was published, other companies. Um, the big thing for them was that if a company was fined, they want to know who it was and when it was, and then the situations or the scenarios around it. So we, that was the plan. We had to do this um, and uh, we had to do it well. Any questions about sort of the high level deliverable? All right. Well, in that case, let me talk to you a little bit about the team that they put in. Um, and I guess it's all downhill from here based on that picture. But the team is we had a, a business analyst um, who was juggling some other projects at the time. We had a PM who really wasn't there that much. Um, me, the tech lead, and then working with another software uh, engineer 50% of the time. And then we had a QA person. Uh, we did a daily release. So I don't know how you what flavor of agile that would be extreme or whatever else. But um, every day, um, in development, we would release a new spreadsheet um, after the work was done and the, it would go to QA and then QA would send it over to the lawyers after a certain point. And then once a week we would get together. Uh, we used Azure and I'll show you all those pieces obviously in a little bit. And we used, uh, this says VS Code, we actually use Visual Studio. Um, you can use either one just to the same effect. Um, I think we use Visual Studio and I'm not sure the reason why over VS Code, but both are available and useful. So small team with a big impact. We good? So, you know, I'm not an architect, so I'm not really good at PowerPoint, obviously. Uh, but this is sort of a high level visual representation of the way we thought about the problem and the way we solved the problem. On the top right, we have a bunch of websites. We have a bunch of Azure functions, and in fact, there was a one-to-one -one correspondence for all a website and an Azure function. So out of the gate, if there were 10 websites to crawl, we had 10 individual Azure functions. Uh, those Azure functions might have some common code libraries. So we weren't like file newing Azure functions for each individual website. And you're saying to yourself, well, that's kind of silly. Don't they have RSS? The answer is some did, most didn't. Another thing you're saying to yourself is, oh my goodness, particularly these government websites are have a varied level of sophistication. Um, so do you really need to treat each website as its own entity? And the answer is absolutely yes. That's what we found. Um, I'm a software engineer at heart. Um, so, you know, I'm as lazy as I, 
they, as they come. If, the, if there was a way to reuse code and reuse a single function across several websites, we would have investigated that first. But ultimately, we found that the variation across different um, states and then federal agencies were such that we needed these individual functions. Once these functions ran and they ran run nightly, they take all the results and they throw it into blob storage. Then in the bottom row, you can see there's another Azure function. That's the glue function. It goes ahead and runs, you know, nightly, maybe a couple hours after the other Azure functions are done and says, okay, looks like I've got some new websites to look at or to analyze. I'm going to take those results. I'm going to pass them over to Lewis. Lewis standing for language understanding intense service. Uh, and if you're not familiar, um, we'll be diving into the details of that in a second, but Lewis is the Microsoft service to do the natural language processing, natural language understanding that we needed to do. So it grabbed all that stuff from Lewis and then it combined it all up into Excel spreadsheet and then it emailed it on off. Is there any questions about the solution architecture? I will be going into individual, each of those boxes, I will go into individual detail in a second. All right. So and this is one of my favorite pictures, the ones with the trees. Um, so what happened? Well, once we got cloud access on this in this enterprise in this big company, uh, we had an end-to-end -end created within a week, and it was because we could use these Azure services pretty much out of the gate and out of the box. It was great. Um, we had we were crawling those websites within a week. Um, and we were populating fields within a week. Um, the initial list of maybe 10 websites we were hitting up um, within four week period. And that last bullet point is, um, is pretty amazing for the kind of um, results and how much money we actually are, are saving this company. And coming in a, a month early and 60% below cost. And, and those costs and month estimates were based on um, sort of like if we had done it on-prem with traditional tooling and everything else. So um, very happy. And, and you can see the sort of that testimony. Uh, I said earlier that I only like to work on projects that can either be bucketed into revenue generation, cost savings, or cost avoidance. Um, I'm very particular when I work on projects that I know who the key stakeholder is. And it doesn't matter what I deliver as much as if he or she is happy, we're happy if they are not. We are not. Um, so getting a testimonial like that was, you know, a really big deal uh, for the, the team. We felt really good about it. So you, enough of this, like Jamie Dixon, yeah, he worked on a project and it was successful, blah, blah, blah. Um, the, the actual details are the components that allowed us to be successful is what we want to focus on. And so that's where we're going next. So in Azure, we had, if you remember, two major areas. We had the web crawling, and then we had the document analysis. On the left-hand side, you can see the web crawling components. We used uh, Azure Storage. We used Azure Functions, and that's pretty much it. We had the app service plan that was keeping track of the Azure function. Um, I don't have in front of me like a list of the people on, the, um, on this webcast. So I don't know, are there any questions about Azure Blob Storage or Azure Functions, how they work, or conceptually no one, I, I should be asking the question, Does are people familiar enough, at least on a conceptual level of what they are, that I can keep going? Yeah, I think we can keep going. Okay, so on the right, which is where the AI piece comes in, we had um, some cognitive services, and these cognitive services were actually not done inside of the typical cognitive services you'd see in Azure. Rather, they were done in Lewis. And in a couple of minutes, we'll be going to Lewis, and I can show you what I mean. But we had to point our Azure instance to Lewis, um, and we had to point it in two different scenarios. First, from the authoring, as authoring, authoring side, as well as the prediction side. And, and honestly, I'm not quite sure why Microsoft did it this way. But I do know that when you go ahead and create your models initially, you're going to have an authoring resource. When you finally get to the point of putting this out in production and hit things are hitting it and you're making predictions back, you have a different um, uh, component. So, okay. Then we have our Azure Functions again. And then we have uh, SendGrid, SendGrid, which is basically just an email service. And then we have that blob storage. And we use the blob storage there to cache our results. So if um, 
Lewis is not necessarily the cheapest service Microsoft has to offer. So one way of mitigating the costs in this um, project was that if we had already analyzed the website and that website had not changed, we do not analyze it again, assuming that the parameters that were being passed in did not change. So it was an easy way to save uh, money. So throwing it into blob storage was the most logical place. And any questions about the components we have? I'll be going into those in the detail in a second. Okay. I think we're good. Good. Thank you. Yep. And so this is enterprise as well as um, software engineering in 2020. So um, DevOps is obviously important. <clears throat> uh, I have two um, uh, ways we've done DevOps. The first one on the top corresponds to those um, web crawling. We had Visual Studio. Uh, we checked our code into GitHub Enterprise. GitHub Enterprise, um, once it got the new code, Team City saw it and picked it up and built it. And then it used Octopus to then deploy it out onto Azure. Uh, so everything sort of just flowed nicely from the development workstation out onto Azure in a CI CD format. We also had different environments, so promoting, uh, using Octopus to promote to QA and then production was obviously a snap. At the bottom, Lewis has a designer to create your models. Lewis models are actually just written or can be represented in JSON, which is fantastic because you don't need to use the Lewis designer to design your models. Now I said fantastic, but I really should maybe temper that with, but you have to know JSON if you're not going to use their designer. We actually had our models sort of parsed and set, set in such a way that we could just go ahead and write the JSON versus messing around their, their designer. But it was still a really nice DevOps win where we took these JSON files, checked them into Teams, uh, into GitHub Enterprise. Team City didn't build anything because there's nothing to build. It's just a bunch, basically, basically a bunch of JSON. Octopus picked those up and then pushed them to the Lewis API endpoints, and our models then would update. You can also export your models, or you could use the designer, make your changes, export it, and then check it in. In any event, um, even though Lewis you know, can be considered a no-code solution, you still obviously want to protect yourself when you start working with clients to, with DevOps. And so this is uh, the, the best way that we knew to, to solve that problem. Uh, Lewis having all those API endpoints to support DevOps was a real win for us. Uh, competing project, pro, excuse me, competing products to Lewis don't necessarily have those, or they're they're definitely late in coming to the market. Uh, so it's a real advantage right now. Any questions about DevOps and how we pushed around code and config? Okay, so here are the individual components that we looked at. Uh, just a quick blurb about each one of them in case you're a little bit hazy. Um, and also why at the bottom we put in a um, sort of in the ita italics why it was so useful for us to build this so ahead of schedule and so under budget. And so Azure storage, everyone's familiar with, um, you know, we, we have these storage and it was easy enough to spin up and we use them to keep track of our search words and everything else. There, there are other, other tables that we use. They're not important to the, the point of tonight, but it was so easy just to stand these things up, make sure that the data was right, and push it on out. Next, we use Azure Functions serverless. Uh, it's still funny to me that people call it serverless. If there is a server. It's just not yours. Um, the, the, the alignment of F-sharp code of functional programming with Azure Functions function is not lost on me. I, I think that Azure Functions are fantastic. I've seen them both used as well as misused, um, particularly in the enterprise setting where individuals would take their mindset about writing C-sharp and really complex object hierarchies and graphs and everything else and shoving them into these functions. Um, we used our functions the way that I believe the AWS Lambda team or the Azure Function team um, encourage them to be used. used. They are very small. They are very compact. They solve one problem and one problem only. And we can then compose them and pipeline them the way we need it to. Azure Functions was a huge benefit when building these sort of computational pipelines of 
first do this, then do this, then do this, then do that. Oh, and if first do this and something fails, then do the other thing. By sort of stacking these Azure functions as our control of flow, we effectively took it out of code and we put it into the environment. And it was a fantastic win for us. F sharp, my uh, favorite language. Uh, the use of F sharp reduced the code base um, by about 80%. And less code with the same result means a whole lot less technical debt. And we spent our time solving the main problems and not writing code for code's sake. Um, I'm very familiar with C sharp. I'm very familiar with JavaScript and Java um, and how they approach the problem. F sharp really aligns to serverless because you're not writing or building these sort of complex hierarchies. You're not writing code that's really only designed for the runtime or the interpreter or the compiler to understand. You're just writing domains problems. It takes a sort of a paradigm shift from your brain, but once you do that, it really becomes liberating and you become very um, effective in writing your code. Uh, to that end, there's actually a conference tomorrow called F Open F Sharp or F Sharp Virtual. I, I, I'll put the link at the end of this. Uh, if you are interested in it, I encourage you to go to that. Uh, there's some great speakers worldwide um, that can talk a little bit about some of their success stories or things about F Sharp to look at. And then Lewis, which is what all the AI people on the call want to talk about. So we have this machine learning uh, NLP, NLU in the cloud. Um, I was a little bit skeptical of Lewis um, based on our prior experience with sort of these NLP as a ser service type solutions. Um, basically, and it was based on other competitors' products. Um, we were pleasantly surprised on how easy it was to use and how effective and accurate it was. It, it, the folks at Microsoft who put this together, we believe, got it right in terms of how do you take something as complex as a you know, deep neural network and then have all this layer of abstraction on it so you're really just controlling the parameters, the inputs to it, and getting outstanding results and having the ability to retrain those models. Um, can't say enough about where Lewis is and where they're going. And the other thing that I really appreciate about Lewis that I think other competing, competing products don't have is it was really designed to be an integration piece. So that all these APIs are not sort of just out there for fluff. We use them to, to become really productive. So Lewis in itself, yeah, it was great because you could stand stuff up and do hello world. But once you start building it into your application pipelines, it becomes really effective. Uh, and the last thing I'll say about Lewis is I don't write any more Lewis code. Once we got it up and running, um, we did a knowledge transfer with some of the attorneys. They're the ones maintaining these lists in Lewis. Um, if you're smart enough to go to law school, you are certainly smart enough to figure out how to um, do Lewis. And in that, we have DevOps and all the kind of guardrails for do, doing application development and deployment. We don't care. They, they could bring a new lawyer in, they screw it up, fine, we'll bring the last one out of source two hours ago. There's, there's no reason why uh, a, 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 a AI team, a data science team, or a, you know, a high-performing software engineering team needs to stay with and maintain Lewis when they have domain experts and, and business users uh, available to them. So that's a really nice other piece of the puzzle. Uh, SendGrid doesn't suck. It sends emails, it, you know, whatever. And so let's go to code. Um, is there any other questions or are there any comments about what I've said so far before we jump right in to the details? Not looking good. Okay. Or it's not sounding good. Is silence golden? I hope so. Um, okay. Well, then let's talk about the code. Um, oh, no. I'm going to actually go to I'll, – I'll thank you all later. So let's start with those web crawling in, in uh, Visual Studio. So this is my home machine. This is a proof of concept project that I did um, before I went over to the enterprise customer. So it's, it's close, but not the same. You can see on the right-hand side in Visual Studio, I have a whole bunch of crawlers. And each one of those has a one-to-one -one correspondence to a website. 
So let me go back uh, to that screenshot I showed earlier of the Department of Justice, and I'll fire it up in my browser over here. And we'll let it spin for a second because it's a government site, so it's not exactly the snappiest. But you can see I put in the word pharmacy, and we have 25 or 50 items per page, and you can see the hits. You can also see at the bottom there's a um, pagination. So if I hit, hit page two, the URI relax, um, reflects it. And if you did page zero, you get talked back to zero, uh, the first page, and then you can um, step on through. So on a web crawling point of view, how do you build something that can crawl this? It goes here, it gets a result. For each one of these, it opens this up. It looks at the detail and says, you know what? I don't care about this fluff on the top. I don't care about these things on the right. I only want the meat of what's in here. And once I get the meat, is it really the meat that I'm interested in? So this is where those Azure functions come, came into play. Um, I'm not going to show you all the code uh, because it's incredibly boring and um, it's basically just screen scraping, um, which most people who've done software engineering understand what it is. And if you're a data scientist, just ask your local software engineer about screen scraping and they'll be happy to tell you about it. Um, but I will point out some pieces. Uh, the first question I have, or I like to ask a question, is that too small? Should I make that bigger? Yes, could we make it just a little bit bigger? How about 100%? How's that look? Uh, maybe just a little <laughs> bit bigger. How about 150%? And it's because you asked, right? Are we good? <laughs> That's good. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Great. And so, yeah. um, so this is F Sharp, and um, so it all compiles down to .NET. You can take this and use this DLL if it was, as it were, and import it into your C Sharp project, and it'll do the conversions for you. Um, I, I usually am talking to C Sharp uh, developers, occasionally a VB.NET developer, and rare occasion of JVM developer using Python about it. So I won't spend a lot of time on the language features themselves, but I'll just point out a couple things just so you're not lost. Um, anywhere you see the word type, if you're a curly brace person, you can think of that as a class. So this is a, a, um, a document. It has a, an ID. It has a URI. And it has a string list, a list of strings to be the content. Um, and then we also have a document entry, which is a class with a parameter where you pass in a search module, a document ID, and everything else. And it inherits from table entity. So that's the real coolness of F Sharp is because it's a first class .NET citizen. I can use all these other libraries that pretty much um, are used by C Sharp developers for the F Sharp purpose. In this case, I am inheriting table entry, or table entity, excuse me, from the covering library for blob storage. Um, so easy enough. I just have to do the inheritance. And then there's a couple pieces in here where if it's new and they don't pass any parameter, I knew of something up with some default values. And then these are a, this is a uh, property, in this case, URI, um, with a getter and a setter. Uh, any questions about classes and types in F Sharp? Um, so if not, the rest of this module, this Azure function that I created, is a series of functions. And it would make sense because it's a functional programming language. So coming over here, uh, if you're not familiar with Azure functions and how you write them, you usually have to have a single entry point. No shock there. That single entry point needs to have an attribute, and it has the function's name. That entry point, in this case, entry fu point fun function called run, needs to have a timer. So at 1 a.m., using this cron expression, at 1 a.m., we have a timer that kicks off, and then it goes ahead and logs the information and does the work. Now, this is a proof of concept, so I hard-coded the search terms in. Um, this is actually put into an Azure table uh, for the lawyers to update when they want to. But here are all the things they were interested in. So what we did basically is go through that Department of Justice site, each one of the search boxes, we pass this in, we get the results, we pull out the results, and we stick it the, into the resulting blob storage. So how do we do that? We first take these search terms and we encode them. So we URI encode them because we're basically faking we're a browser. So encode search term up here, 
system, web, HTTP, utility, HTML, and code. That's it. So the search term comes in, I trim off any white space, and I encode it. So if there's a space between affordable care and act, I can't remember what that is, like it's percent something for URI encoding. Um, I guess I'd have to ask my local web dev what it, how it renders out. But the, the, the brilliance is this. This line of code is so powerful, and we, we almost overlooked it. But from a terseness point of view, um, you know, I've written enough C Sharp, enough Java, enough Python, Node. I can tell you, this is the best way in my brain to express how to apply a single function, in this case, encode search term, to an entire list of items. So search terms, if you remember, is this string list right there. What this says is, okay, that's a sequence, I innumerable, really. And I'm going to go ahead and use the most fundamental function in functional programming, which is called map. If you're not familiar, map means take something and turn it into something else. You could say seek.transform if you're, if you're looking for a mental model. So I actually, once I started really learning functional programming, I looked at the world and I said, hey, everything is a, everything is a map. Like right now, you're mapping the audio signals from my voice through the computer into your brain. And then it's mapping the, 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 the visual uh, information from the screen into your brain, and then you're mapping somewhere in there that this is a good idea or a bad idea, or Jamie's a terrible presenter, he's a great presenter. Like, all these are maps. In fact, I can make a pretty good argument that 98% of everything that I've ever seen in enterprise software development is just a series of maps. It's a series of transformations, whether it's a user typing stuff into the website, and the website going to a database, and then mapping it over, and there's a mapping to validation, et cetera, et cetera. So, you'll see a lot of F-sharp programming using this sort of Sendu, which if you're familiar with PowerShell, same kind of thing, a pipe operator. Unix world, you certainly know it. Where I'm gonna take search terms and I'm gonna send it over to this function called seek map. And seek map takes exactly two parameters, though it's kind of hard to read if you're not used to the F-sharp. The first is a lambda. I did not, this fun keyword means I have an anonymous function. It has a parameter called ST. So that stands for search term, singular. And then I'm going to go ahead and encode that search term. Effectively, what we've done is picture we had a list of 20 things. We ran seek map. We still have a list of 20 things. But each row is now converted because it applied that function 20 times. So well-being, for example, on line 195, that turned into well in, uh, URL encoded well-being with some kind of percentage sign between the well and the being. This is why I love F Sharp. And this is one of the reasons that we can deliver early. We spend zero time building these sort of complex architectural diagrams or thinking about class hierarchies and all this other garbage. All we said is, where's the data? How do we map it? How do I get the results? Oh, so the mapping failed. What's my, what's my alternative path? Wash, rinse, repeat. How many times you need it? Bam, we got our results. We have encoded search terms. Seek.iter is the same thing as seek.map. The only difference is iter means don't, tan, don't send me the results. So this says, we took that encoded string type, this should probably be EST if you really wanted to, and go ahead and handle that search term and apply it. And handle search term up here says, okay, go ahead and extract the documents from whatever search term it is, iter through them, and pass them on in to <coughs> the blob storage, and then insert it into that metadata table that keeps track of the GUID and when's the last time we ran it and all this other stuff. So that's it. All the other code is basically how you um, parse web pages with a lot of, um, uh, what is it, X, X, X HTML garbage stuff. Oh, God, it drove me a walk. Having help and having software developers who enjoy parsing web pages was a real lifesaver to me. Um, but that's all the rest of these things do. It's just like, okay, now I have a page. Okay, find the right class or find the right list item of it, and then iterate, iterate, pull the data out, and, and do your magic with it. So that was a whirlwind tour of F Sharp and how we did it. All the other pages in here look, they, the, the, the idea of encoding and then maybe going out, getting the information and bringing it back and sticking it in a blob storage, all the same mechanics. You can see all of them will have a document entry and a document in here. They'll have a different URI, obviously. And how they parse the web page will be fundamentally different depending on how that particular state or federal government agency created their web pages. Um, some of them were in PDF. So we took those PDFs um, and we took those 
and we passed them out to the Lewis service for vision recognition. That took the PDF as an image, let's say, and took the text and put it back. But that was just a couple more steps that we did as we iterated through these web pages. And that's pretty much all there is from the web crawling. Now we just check it into source. Each one of these at the bottom that says function name becomes its own function. If it's already there, it gets replaced. And uh, uh, we, we go for the win. Any questions about how we crawl the internet? Uh, I know I just given you a wall of words and a lot of code and some of the code you may or may not be uh, familiar with. Uh, so if there are questions afterwards and you want to talk about um, how to solve certain abstract cases, maybe less concrete than here, I'm, I'm happy to do that. So I, I did actually have, have a question. So you talk a lot about F Sharp. Um, uh -huh. uh, I, I know you have a wealth of experience programming. Uh, so I have never used F Sharp. If somebody was to start um, programming today um, and programming with the intent of using uh, some of these cognitive services in Azure, would your recommendation be uh, C Sharp, F Sharp, or Python? So uh, I can answer that in a couple different ways. Um, well, I'm going to give you several answers or examples. First is, the other software engineer on my team was a generalist, writes Python, C++. I think his last gig was Java. It took him about a day to pick up the F sharp. So there's, okay. you know, if you're a reasonably competent developer, which I'm guessing everyone on the phone call is, um, it, all you have to do is open up and try it. The, the biggest limitation, the biggest challenge will be that there's only like two or three constructs that apply to everything. Once you wrap your head around that, really, you can do all the things you want to do with a very terse and very, you know, language. For me, it was very depressing because I realized I was writing a whole bunch of code for no other reason than write code. Um, but yes, so the, I find it a very low barrier to entry, particularly for folks um, who have an open mind and some software experience. Um, I know students also um, uh, gravitate to it. I think the hardest landing are perhaps C sharp developers who have been doing they might have 20 years of experience, but it's just one year of experience times 20. It's not 20 years of progressive experience. Um, the second thing is, if I was going to write, uh, if, if you and I were going to start a company and we were going to use Azure Functions, um, I would start with the .NET language. I know Python was on there v1. I don't know how supported it is in v2 and v3, um, but it, it does seem like it's not, it's not necessarily the redheaded stepchild, but it's certainly the .NET languages at Microsoft on Azure get a lot of love. Just like if you went over to AWS, if we decided to do AWS, my suspicion is that Node would be uh, the, the first class citizen there uh, with maybe Java behind it. Um, .NET's over there, but I don't think it gets the, quite the attention um, that it really uh, deserves. So saying that, would I use C Sharp or F Sharp? I would use F Sharp because it's a lot less language. It's, you know, I can solve problems a lot faster. And it forces me to modularize my problems. So instead of trying to send, solve 10 problems at once, which is the sort of the tendency when you have object-oriented solutions, you just solve one step at a time, each step passes, and you compose them together. Um, but a lot of people enjoy using C Sharp. They will enjoy using it on Azure Functions, and I'm sure they're successful. Um, but my preference, or if I, if I, particularly if I had like a sharp deadline and a lot of money at stake, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a language that really supports that. Do you have um, some good references as far as um, learning material for for F Sharp that you would recommend? Sure, I, I'd start with try F Sharp. Um, did I spell that right? Yeah, try.fsharp.org. This has everything. This has the REPL in the in the browser. So you don't even have to install Visual Studio or Visual Studio Studio Code. It's just like any other. Um, notebook out there, you can write some stuff and then um, see how it does inside your browser. Um, the F Sharp organization. So F Sharp, F S H A R P. So F Sharp started at Microsoft at, um, you know, not, at, oh, they're, wow, they're having a conference in November. They're ambitious. Um, it started at, in Cambridge and the guy who wrote, uh, I believe, generics for C Sharp, Don Syme, wrote this because Microsoft said we need a functional language, we need it now. It was like the height of the map reduced and that's all functional programming. 
Um, and so fsharp.org is the foundation. They have everything you need, including guides and how to do it. If you do pick it up and you use it, um, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised how easy it is. Um, but get ready. You're, you're no longer, if you're only a .NET developer, um, you, the person you're talking to for help very well might be on a, a Mac <laughs> or on Linux and maybe in a different country. And every person that I've ever met on this organization is fantastic, very welcoming, such a great community. So those are the two places I'd start. Cool. And, and you did bring up the F Sharp conference starting tomorrow, the, the F Sharp conf. Uh, so yes, tell us a little bit more about that. I don't know anything more than that other than they're throwing a conference. <laughs> yeah. And they're, they're doing some really cool stuff. Um, I actually have a full plate tomorrow. So the chances of me actually getting into this is going to be a, a challenge, but it's all being recorded. So I might pick up a couple of uh, sessions along the way. Yeah, it's it's been great. The number of uh, training opportunities that have been online over the last like six weeks, just phenom phenomenal. I, I don't have enough hours in the day to huh. learn all the things I want to learn right now that yeah. I, I can attend any conference anywhere and it's, it's amazing. Yep. Well, yeah. So hopefully, um, yeah, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to sell F sharp. I'm here to solve, s sell, uh, solutions. And it was a great yeah. piece of it. Uh, the project, if I had to use C sharp on this project, we would have delivered it. It just wouldn't have been as fast and probably would have cost more money, but we still would have gotten it done. So, um, I don't mean just, or, you know, if we don't in Java and everything else, but it, it's definitely, for me, it was definitely worthwhile to look at and, and, um, and use. Okay. So, um, we have a little bit of time left, and I know, I, I'm sorry if I've been taking too long to get to the point that everyone else wants to get to, which is probably the preview.lewis.org, but here's Lewis. I, I, uh, did I, um, is, it, is it not org? It's maybe com? It's lewis.com? Huh. Preview.lewis.com. And they just have a better UI, the preview one. Okay, it doesn't like that, so let's try Lewis. Okay. So here's Lewis. <laughs> so in any way, it's weird because Lewis is built as a spike and they haven't quite brought it into the Azure um, experience. So if you log into Microsoft Azure, you have Lewis resources, but to actually do everything you need to do, you have to go to, oh, it's Lewis.ai. That's, that's why. Um, no matter, they're all hooked up together and your billing still works with Lewis um, and, and everything else. So it is well, might as well be integrated. And I'm sure in the future, um, the Cognitive Service Lewis group will be bringing it into the Azure portal. But until then, just go to lewis.ai. And so once you log into Lewis, and you, um, I already have a, a, a model created because I wanted to show you the pieces of it. But you could go ahead and create a new app and, and follow the prompts and maybe some of the tutorials to build it. But this Lewis app, has two major pieces. If you remember the Excel spreadsheet, one of the things that the lawyers were very interested in was, hey, who else, what competitors are being mentioned in these Department of Justice um, uh, briefings or bulletins? Well, that is an entity. So let's use the entity extraction feature of Lewis to figure out who's in there. And as you imagine, this is just a glorified regex where I'm gonna go ahead and create a list of competitors. And in those, this is an insurance company I was working with. I'm going to list their competitors and then any synonyms for them. And what we're gonna do then is call Lewis and if it sees a competitor in there or a synonym, it's gonna send the results. So Cigna right here, it has lowercase Cigna or Connecticut General, I guess that's an old name for Cigna. Um, if it runs across Connecticut General, it's gonna return Cigna. That's how you extract entities out of Lewis. It's really that stupid simple. Is there any questions about extracting entities or defining entities? There's pre-built entities that, I, that we can look at. So let's say you might have some natural language uh, understanding uh, libraries the way I did and maybe some competitor project products. Um, and you might have a definition of how to identify money as a regex or a series of regex. Well, you can see the type here is pre-built. And so money is defined by Microsoft. So Microsoft's models will go out there and say, hey, there's $50, there's $100. This looks like money to me. 
Therefore, you don't have to worry about defining it. So when you come over here, you can click on add pre-built entity and you can see the scope of what Lewis has. I wasn't interested in any of this stuff, so I didn't bring him in, but you can see it, it, all the different ways you can represent age, both you, you, imperial and uh, metric or US and Europe, your European is in here. Uh, the different ways of date time, the dimensionality, email, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the one that I think would be really helpful that I didn't use because it wasn't specific to this project is person's name. I've written so much code in my life to identify people's names and I still can't do it right. Microsoft might not do it right, but at least it's their freaking problem. And it was so great to see that in the pre-built entities. Uh, any questions about pre-built entities or building your own entity list? Okay, so that's kind of cool, but you know, pretty much everyone can extract entities. And if you're motivated enough, you can write enough, you know, pick your language, SQL, manage code, whatever, to, to extract entities. The real natural language uh, understanding, um, natural language processing is this intense. And this is freaking awesome. Now, I just did one example for you, and I called it fine. So if you remember, you had that column that said, this is the fine amount um, for a given uh, competitor. The problem is if I just search for money, it might say something like, Signal is fine 50 million, representing a $20 million industry. Well, I don't care about the $20 million industry. I only care about the fine that was associated with Signal. So how do I do that? Well, it's no longer just using, you know, nouns to, tr you know, search nouns. It's actually using the intent, which is actually looking at the whole sentence or the piece of the sentence. And the, the technology behind this is far superior than anything I could handwrite um, by myself using any kind of neural network. Um, it just works. And, and this is really where our giggle moment happened when we started using it. We started screwing around with intents and we were really pleasantly surprised at how well it um, worked. So right here under fine, all we had to do is pass in example user input of what a finding might be. So um, I have two examples written in here. I wrote dollar symbol, $500,000 penalty. It flagged it as money. So if I see the word that amount with penalty or other combinations that I don't even put in, it says, yeah, that's the fine. And then there's pay fine of 1.95 million down there. I can do other ones too, like, um, the, I don't know if fee works, but fee of 10 bucks. And I come down here, enter, and then you can see it, it tagged the 10 bucks as entity and now fee of 10 bucks. It has a lower confidence that fee has already matched my other stuff, so maybe it's a little bit lower. But notice that the train turned from green to red. Because I've entered, basically changed my config file, it now wants to be retrained. I hit train here. It's going to queue it up. And then my model will reflect both the first two that I had as well as this fee number. And once I'm ready and I think it's all good, I can come over here to test it and I'll say like fee of 20 bucks or $210 because I'm bad on the keyboard. And it says, yeah, this is, I have 92%, 93% chance that it's fine. So what we did was our Azure function went out to the Lewis API and passed in a bunch of text from that website that you've already seen crawled. And it sent back a bunch of JSON that said, hey, I think this is a fine of a 95% confidence. And we just put a, a threshold on it and say, oh, okay, 95%, yeah, that's good. Maybe 70%, yeah, maybe, maybe not. And that's how we put, extracted, map, if you're a functional programmer, the text from the website that we've already crawled to the Lewis model to get the results we want. And once we tested things, we went ahead and published it, and sure, we'll throw it in production slot. And that just really means is that that Azure function, that second Azure function that I wrote, um, you know, has some config. And so the endpoint that we hit, as well as the app ID and some of the other things that we use, like the 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 OAuth uh, bearer token, that's all sort of thrown in there, and that's what that was all about. And literally, that was it. I don't touch this stuff anymore. The lawyer comes in, they type in stuff. They look at the percentage, they hit train, they or test, or they hit train first, then they hit test, they like it, they hit publish. Um, it saves it into DevOps, it goes on out, pushes it out again, and um, we all profit. So 
that alone in Lewis compared to the competitor products that we were using in my natural language processing area was huge. Now we have other projects. Lewis may not be the best fit because it's very, um, you know, it, it's designed to solve certain problems and the other problems that we have are much more, they require a higher level of data science uh, and experimentation. But for this one particular project, it was a lifesaver. And it was, and I can't emphasize enough how easy it was to spin this up and get low hanging fruit out the door. So I just showed you some Lewis. Are there questions or comments about Lewis? Uh, no questions from the crowd. Okay. You didn't call them a peanut gallery, so I suppose that's good. <laughs> um, okay, well, let me, um, I don't think, no, I, I had another slide, I think, that was going to show you the glue code between the blob and the, and the Lewis APIs, but it's just an API and JSON comes back when we parse the JSON, so it's not really worth showing. Um, so this is my thank you slide. Um, are there any other questions? If people think of them later, feel free to email me. I'll put this on GitHub if anyone's interested in the, the deck and the code samples. And that's it. So uh, any comments? Yeah, if you'd like to go ahead and share uh, the GitHub link. Oh, I haven't done it yet. I'll do okay. I'll share in the meetup, how about? But, um, Thank you, Jamie, and uh, you're you're making me miss the snow with with all of your beautiful pictures. So so thank you. It, it doesn't snow in Houston quite that often. Uh, you know, I am going to build a, a a global AI node here in Denver. So maybe you and your friends can come on out and go skiing and do artificial intelligence or machine learning. Wouldn't that be fun? You know, you don't have to ask me twice. Uh, Deal. My my daughter loves the snow, and we great. would love to come and hang out. And so, uh, it's it's been great to chat with you tonight. And uh, you know, it's always interesting to hear about how people leverage the different technologies. So, of course, you heard that I I don't use the F sharp. So it was great to hear about that and how you're leveraging that. And um, I hope that our, our viewers were able to, to take away something new as well. So, so thank you. Thank you. So to our viewers, thank you so much for spending the time. This is AI Talks Live, a production of Global AI Community. Um, we will be posting Jamie's video on YouTube, and you can go ahead and search for that on the Global AI Community channel. All right, so thank you all and have a good night. Thank you again.